an honor to be hosting you today as my guest in the insightful conversations series uh, it has been pretty much a dream for me to meet you um after several several years i've got the opportunity to do that so i'm very humbled as i sit in front of you and speak to you roland you are too kind <laughs> Um so Roland I see that um uh, you have such a beautiful history behind you and you're currently the Drucker senior fellow you lead the center for the future of organization and you are also the founder and chairman of the executive corporate learning forum These three bowl me over and the first one in terms of the future of the organization i really would like to understand what is it that you do there and how is the future of work look to you roland you mean again it's too kind and, and it's a really really nice introduction well you know the future of organization the center is called the future of organization and not organizations because i am talking about how we reconfigure the way we organize work which goes maybe beyond the boundaries of a traditional organization right, right. um what we've been doing uh, there is a focus on issues like digital transformation and very lately on on business ecosystem leadership and organization something i guess we're going to talk about in this conversation uh, a little bit longer for me it's kind of a sandbox Uh, of you know very i want to do some research and, and and projects that interest me that intrigue me you know that spark my uh, imagination also and the second thing it's to be honest also a way to reach out and connect to the world uh the drucker brand is a great brand everybody knows peter drucker we have with the global drucker forum i think the most prominent uh, leadership and management conference on the planet annually which creates a great network of scholars but not only scholars you know major consultancies uh senior executives it's an interesting network you can build and this is also in a way the business model of the center is really connecting with people all across the globe on issues that are uh, relevant for the future of organization um yeah i mean you mentioned the future of work uh, it's part of that because huh. you know actually it's very funny you saying that we're planning a the global summit within the executive corporate learning forum for fall Beautiful. and originally it was called you know workforce transformation and then the crisis hit with covid-19 and now of course it's a very very uh, current topic workforce transformation but i recently added dash organizational transformation because we cannot see workforce transformation without organizational So this is something we would definitely look at as well. We're not another center for the future of work. There are many out there, uh, but of course the future of work is on our radar as well. Beautiful, beautiful. I think what I hear you say is uh, that the future of work and the future of organization are so totally correlated and, and interconnected. And uh, all your life, I guess you've been designing and redesigning organizations and who better than to respond to this question so thank you so much roland for that um so you know it's it's uh, you've written so much about organizational ecosystems and uh, you've studied so much about it and you speak so much about it passionately in many of your books um how does uh, you know an organizational ecosystem encourage or deter leaders do you see a relationship between the two well maybe maybe we have to take a step back for that a little bit and then talk what is an ecosystem at all right Absolutely. i mean um it's quite interesting we have been living in ecosystems uh, in my opinion of course uh, all our lives uh, and 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 it goes further back because without ecosystems it could not exist and it starts you know with a natural biosphere which is an ecosystem of course and every company also in the olden days had its supply chain you know had its customers had its stakeholders like regulators and so on and so forth and that always was in a way an ecosystem the way though that traditional organizations were organized or still are by the way in many many ways is a kind of a linear 
supply chain type of thinking where they produce things and then they throw it out over the wall, hope the customer and the market likes it. And if not, they have big campaigns to tell them you have to like it. And, and, and these things have changed. So what we see now with the ecosystem is a, is a new age of the ecosystem, if you may say so. It's something what digital really has brought us because digital transformation forced many organizations to collaborate in new ways in order to create, for instance, digitally enhanced products and services. They needed to partner, and they still need to partner up with outside um, uh, players who provide services, maybe the most uh, prevalent one and, and, and uh, archetypical one would be cloud services, right? So if, if, if you do something, you now use the cloud and with the cloud, it allows you new ways to collaborate, new ways to develop certain kind of services and products. But it also goes for many other things. You now think about mobility, the future of mobility, you need a lot of sensors, uh, internet of things, and all these kind of stuff you have to tab into as a capability in order to get your product and service done. You usually do not have in your own capability sure. portfolios. You must collaborate. You must reach out. And, and so the ecosystem imperative almost now has come. Now, a, a lot has been done about platforms, of course, recently. And that uh, was, uh, you know, I think the book by Marshall Alstein, uh, which already quite a while ago, made the platform idea a, a very prominent idea. But platforms are just one subsystem of uh, ecosystems in my definition. So, so I define them as interdependent ways to do business, not linear, but interdependent, which means network. And it's usually, you know, with, with stakeholders of different size, different kind of operating models and so on and so forth. We may be going to this a little bit more. Now, if we look at ecosystems this way, it means we, we have to deal with constituencies that we do not control in a traditional way. It's now going back to your question about leadership. Leadership in a, let's say, maybe Western way, um, or let's say in a traditional management of the 20th century way, uh, has been something that you would be uh, wise and smart as a leader because you know what's going to happen. You've got your consultants telling you the future. Then you think about now, how can I really cope with this future? And then you devise a strategy and then you design an organization and then you tell the people what to do, right? And your role is to make sure uh, that these things are done. And so we put in control and command mechanisms um, uh, to make sure and tailorism that also makes all these processes very efficient, uh, you know, and, and cost saving has been more or less the kingpin of that management model. Now, that type of leadership where the leader is the know-it-all and the leader is the one who calls the shots and the leader is the one who tells you what to do does not work in an ecosystem. Mm. Because the ecosystem processes that are really driving your business and driving your activities, they do not happen at the corporate headquarters that is usually 20,000, maybe 30,000 feet above the ground. They, they happen at the customer, at the market. There were maybe innovation hubs and you know, kind of incubators mm. happen and they do not happen and they try a lot to bring that into the headquarters but it, it usually does not work mm -hmm. so leadership needs to be something that happens really at the boundary of the organization at the periphery and having said this it means for leadership number one uh, that it is pushed down to the edges of the organization and the edges are the place where also change and transformation happens which means that the traditional leader who sits these 30,000 feet above the ground is not really the decisive one. I mean, there is still a role, of course, for corporate and a role for, let's say, the traditional top management in shaping the overall, you know, architecture, maybe uh, creating a, a clear vision and a purpose that, that helps to keep together a, otherwise, you know, maybe central fugal forces of what's happening all out there at these boundaries. But uh, leadership really means 
to enable and empower people who are not traditionally maybe in a leadership role to lead in their little space, uh, giving them the kind of responsibility and also the real empowerment uh, to make decisions, to collaborate, to co-create, and just make sure with mechanisms that are very much built into the cultural and need to be built into the cultural uh, fabric of, of the firm, and make sure that then, you know, this still remains an identity of a company that this person works for. You, so that's in maybe too long an answer, but... Uh, so, so beautiful, contextual, and so different and relevant. Um, I got one insight that was beautiful, which said leadership is more at the boundaries, given the current um, changes and shifts that we are seeing in the world and mm -hmm. beautiful, beautiful Roland. Um, this leads me to the to, to another uh, question, which is around um, whenever we have business ecosystems, small, medium or big, um, you do see, you know, a, a lot of navigation that is required um, at all levels, you know, to be successful, to make your presence felt, um, to, to be effective. Um, and what would your top two recommendations be for individuals who have to navigate well in an ecosystem? And the reason I ask this is because um, many years ago, there were several leaders who said, uh, you know, navigation and navigation as a skill is an important trait that one should develop um, as one goes up the ladder. And so what are your perspectives about it? Well, that's a really interesting question. Because, um, you know, I think ecosystems are also, again, almost a, a paradigm for the uncertainty that is out there. Uh, an ecosystem is an ongoing flux and change because technology is evolving. And other things happen like COVID-19, for instance, that shakes up a lot of things. And uh, it's not that these things will go away. You know, surprisefulness in the environment is always increasing and will increase in, in the near future, sure, you know, with all the really technological changes coming up. We were briefly talking before about the future of work, artificial intelligence, all these kinds of things. Uh, so navigating this means you you cannot have uh, like a you know a captain a, a clear charted waters where you know where to go. You really have to be alert. You have to have senses of uh, what's changing, and you've got to have this openness, embracing the unknown. Um, having said this, there there are still some principles to navigate. I think um, so. So one thing is. Uh, it, it's clearly that you need an, an, an open mind and you need this kind of, um, how should I frame that? Um, uh, you, have to, you have this curiosity to go out there and see what else is out there than my operating model, than my business model, than my frame of mind, than my understanding how markets work, how my understanding is what my industry is. Because an ecosystem changes, an ecosystem perspective changes. Mm -hmm. uh, you suddenly find yourself, you thought you might be agricultural industry, but you're in a technology industry suddenly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or you may be in mobility. Uh, 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 examples of companies now with intelligent uh, tractors, for instance, mm -hmm. right? That are connected and mm -hmm. understand certain kinds of things. It's, you need to understand suddenly networks and so on and so forth. So I think open-mindedness is, is maybe a capability, but it's also a condition to navigate. Um, the other thing, so curiosity is, is, is a key element as you go from business model to business model, from operating model to operating model, from, from a new industry you didn't know about, mm -hmm. uh, to new you know, kind of technology you didn't know about. Mm -hmm. and, and so, being open and, and, and not stay within your world, I think is a, is a very important element of navigating. The, the other thing that, that I see is, you know, kind of, you cannot navigate that, or at least, let's say the implication of this is that you, have a, you must have an attitude to ongoing change and questioning what you do yourself. 
because your model is impacted. Mm. Now, by definition, if it's an interdependent network, interdependency means there is a mutual change process going on. So I'm curious about learning something, but the moment I learned that it might have impact and will usually actually have impact on who I am, what I do, what my operating model is. So this kind of joint co-learning, you know, we often talk about co-creation. There's okay. even more, there is co-learning, there is co-development. An ecosystem is the ability, ecosystem leadership means the ability to co-develop something larger than just myself. But that means also possibly to have to change myself and continuously question myself. Mm. Beautiful. So you spoke about openness and you spoke about curiosity and uh, having redesigned and reshaped, probably revisioned several organizations. I'm sure these two are your biggest insights as well as you reflect on your journey so far. Am I correct in saying that, Roland? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very nice thing to say, Mina. Well, you know, I personally, you know, I, I love to stay curious in ways that I, I do not read a lot of business books, to be honest, right? I try, I read history, I read you know, all, all kinds of different things where I try to go outside my boundaries. Mm. I think it's true for everything. Correct. You know, look at disciplines, uh, you know, I mean, a business schools, the traditional MBA goes into finance and marketing and the usual kind of very close stuff. Peter Drucker, uh, having said this, right, uh, being also a senior Drucker fellow, Peter Drucker perceived and, and, and defined management as a liberal art and found that leadership and management and business has much more to do than just, you know, secure the bottom line and grow. It also has a social responsibility. Mm. It has a responsibility to shape the planet as a, as a responsible citizen um, and so on and so forth, which means Disciplines like anthropology, political science, psychology, you know, they, they all play into this. It's not just numbers, it's not just finance. Right. And uh, so so going across these boundaries has to me always been important. Same thing, you know, I'm originally from Austria. I, I moved to the United States. I still go back and forth a lot. So this going, you know, crossing these boundaries, national, international, interdisciplinary, uh, cross-functional, for instance. I think curiosity is one of the key elements, anyway, in leading and managing. You know, if, if, if you if you stay as a finance guy, just in finance, and you don't understand what's going on in strategy and in HR and in other things, you you, you have this functional blinders, this, this silos, which, you know, lots of companies complain about. And the same goes for businesses. I do only, you know, kind of, I make these cups. And so I don't think about anything else. In an ecosystem thinking, that is not working, because these cups tomorrow may be smart and measure the temperature or the volume which is in there, or they can do what also other kinds of things. And others than the cup makers maybe have the key capabilities that just self dirty. Okay. <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful. So you have brought in aspects of uh, uh, interconnectedness, uh, interdisciplinary learning and uh, collaboration that makes organization tick. And uh, if this is not adopted by organizations soon enough, um, going forward, I guess it's going to be a much more difficult thing because it's only getting more and more geosynchronous and more and more collaborative, uh, Roland. So beautiful. Um, so you, you know, in one of your conversations have defined, um, you know, business ecosystem as a very interdependent value creating network about which you definitely spoke some time ago um, and would you like to also talk about does such interconnectedness also bring in elements of power dynamics across organizations within organizations and i'm very inquisitive about this because uh, power is not going to go away and it is probably the least talked about subject in management Nobody wants to talk about it, but it exists. So I wanted to 
I uh, wanted to seek your help in unbreaking the enigma that I've been retaining in my head for several years now. Well, I mean, you know, I think power is at the at the core of everything when it comes to human interaction, you know, and organizations are just another form. And there are, of course, humans in there. And if there's humans <laughs> in there, there's power dynamics going on. You know, there is also, you know, the traditional way to look at organizations is, you know, you have an org chart with people who have responsibilities and uh, they're supposed obviously to act on those responsibilities and roles. And then it's all described. That's the old 20th century model. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with organizational network analytics, right? Where you would uh, draw Absolutely. all kinds of networked type of charts yeah. that tell you who is powerful. In an organization, maybe not formally, yeah. but informally. Right? Yeah. I saw the other day a chart, you know, that had tons of people on there and the influencers were really big. And the biggest influencer was Heidi, right? Heidi is the girl in the mail room, right? Because she meets everybody right. and she talks to everybody and she knows everybody. Yes. And she knows much, much more than the CEO, the company <laughs> CEO knows really nothing. I mean, I mean, he knows a lot of other things, but what's really going on in the organization, the further you're up, the less people talk. So a lot of stuff is going on that way. So if we look at power in organizations, we need to uh, differentiate between formal power and informal power. Beautiful. Both are important. Mm. It's not that we want to, you know, go away now and everything is informal and everything is network and everything is now just uh, fluid. Mm. The truth is we have both. And only if we manage both well, uh, things go well. It's like with ambidexterity. You yeah. cannot only be a lean startup if you are a 100,000 people organization. You, you still have a structured core, uh, but you also need to innovate. So it's really both things. And the same thing goes with power. Mm. So we, we, we look at formal power, um, which means there's a CEO, there is the C-level, the senior vice presidents and so on, further down in, in hierarchy. And in, in many ways, hierarchy uh, the principle of hierarchy won't go away, in, in, in my humble opinion. You know, it's, it's a dream to say everything is holocratic and every, everybody is equal and it, it won't work that way. We, we need structures and we need responsibilities. We need, sadly, alienation in organizations. And uh, that's maybe something we come later to as well. It's not that uh, organizations can be broken down into such small units that just play with each other and. Uh, you know, the, the, the alienation of large structures does not happen. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, um, so, so so we have that formal one, but the informal one has always been underestimated. Mm -hmm. And only very recently, you know, with social media and, and, and technologies that also made these things visible. Mm -hmm. uh, suddenly the, uh, you know, water cooler and place in the kitchen uh -huh. become more important. Right. This is, by the way, as, as we are doing here, a virtual uh, interview on Zoom and the whole world is on Zoom right now. Uh, this informal, you know, kind of water cooler conversations and you meet in the hallway uh, is missing out <laughs> a little bit. As we are with a Zoom, you know, the, the, we don't have the technology left for the informal that much. Right. So if we speak about power. Lots of stuff that is very decisive in organizations is not decided in formal meetings. It's it's decided, you know, when two people meet in the restroom and have a conversation and say, let's do that, right? And then they maybe hash out strategies how to get it done. The informal is where the power games happen. Now, the the interesting thing is how do you map that kind of power and um, I just, with whom did I talk recently? I think it was one of my colleagues, Bill Passmore, who is the Center for Creative Leadership mm -hmm. and uh, also a professor uh, at Columbia University and has done very interesting work on graded organizations, which is a, 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 a perspective on, on ecosystems. I uh, said he's working on a, on a new book, which, which looks exactly at advanced consulting which means consulting that considers exactly these informal power kind of things, because the traditional consulting that makes slides and expects because of slides, things will change. is just not working. Right? So things change if you understand these dynamics. Mm -hmm. 
Now, it needs some training to do that. And, and usually people who think linear are not trained to understand these kind of interplay of, you know, power dynamics. Mm-hmm. And they need a kind of a systems dynamic training, group dynamics, you know, that, that organizational dynamics that, that understand these kind of things. Mm-hmm. And with ecosystems, it becomes a little bit more tricky mm-hmm. because, you know, you, you can do an organizational network analysis if you own the organization, you can throw down your survey, you know, and, and you yeah. get the data and you can, to a certain extent at least, mm-hmm. command the cultural survey, the ONA survey, and so on. It's harder to command in an ecosystem. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if, if I want to make sure to really get a, let's say, social network graph of an ecosystem, the methodology is a challenge, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, sometimes it's also the problem that a single guy who owns, let's say, a patent and uh, has the power to license this patent may have a bigger power in an ecosystem than a 200,000 people company that is maybe manufacturing then at the end of the day these things. Correct, correct. So, so beautiful. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you really spoke about the informal power networks that are much more influencing in organizations. You also touched upon the lack of those because of the current Zoom uh, conversations that people seem to be having. leads me to a very interesting question which is um, most of in, most of the innovation whenever we, we, we read about innovative stories um, it talks about a sudden idea that erupted when a person was alone or when we, when he was having an if he or she was having an informal conversation with somebody so right. you also have worked so extensively in the innovation space does your mind tell you that given the shift in the informal conversations that's happening globally, thanks to COVID, um, innovation will will suffer in any way because of the lack of informal conversations or the lack of informal networks, the lack of approaches, uh, which, which happen when you have a face-to-face kind of a human connect. Do you see that getting impacted, Roland? That's an interesting question. I actually haven't thought about that in that way i mean one thing is true that serendipity plays an important role right in innovation um generally you know also when it comes to power things and making things happen you know it, it, it's it's very funny many of, of the things that i'm for instance have been writing it's not that it was systematic study it was just, oh i had a coffee with a friend and suddenly that model came up and and then of course you write it out uh, that's an interesting question. Well, you know, I I think, number one, that, that technologies are emerging quite fast right now that, you know, help, help us with, with virtual conversation. There's also stuff out there, of course, like virtual reality and, and, and these things, which, which will provide these kind of uh, encounters. But uh, this is in very infancy right now still, of course, right? It's, it's too cumbersome stuff you have to wear. Um, is innovation impacted by that? Yeah, I, I could imagine it is in, in, in some way. Mm-hmm. I, one of the problems, you know, with innovation, I don't know, I mean, if you, if you looked at these things, but I just yesterday had a conversation with a senior executive from a major global corporation who is in charge of their accelerator program. And so they, they, they have these accelerators but uh, they have a hard time to make innovation happen. This thing is outside at the fringe. He called it innovation theater, right? Or we call it sometimes just innovation activism. We, we do things and we believe we innovate. We yeah. put together people in hackathons and have them co-create and all these kinds of stuff. And um, I think for that kind of things, you need really um, the intensity of this interaction, these, 24 hours hackathon kind of thing where you at the end, you know, you, wow, I've done it. It's hard to imagine that really on Zoom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have to say or on Microsoft Teams or Skype or whatever. Right. On the other hand, you need for innovation also the connection to the core 
not necessarily make the core like a startup, but you have to make sure to sustain innovation that is more just than innovation theater. You need to translate it into sustaining, you know, kind of mainstream operations as well, at least, and the products and services that come out. And that, uh, you know, it, it challenges us definitely totally virtually only doing this. Okay. Um, I have not really an answer to that question, but it's a really interesting question. Yeah, I, 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 I'm worried sometimes um, at, at the future, as much as I'm very positive about it, some of these uh, aspects really concern me. Um, that brings me to the next thought, which is, uh, you know, as much as we are getting digitized and digitalized across organization, um, do you still see uh, human centeredness or human centric organizations or human centric leadership as a requisite in whatever way the world moves? Do you see that as an important aspect in the construct or design of organizations? I don't think it's uh, important, it's actually imperative. It's actually becoming more important in my humble opinion, right? Because um, we can see digital in two ways and that also relates to the future of work. We can see it, you know, as the glass is half empty. Oh my God, our jobs are being taken away, you know, everything's automated and what, I go what am I going to do? Um, and uh, we can see it in the glass half full saying actually, wow, there's a lot of things now I can do. Right, which is uh, going back to the very human element of you know curiosity, creativity, connectivity, you know that kind of having an individual purpose, almost spiritual in a way. It's 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 how should I s I frame that? Another colleague of mine often spoke about saying, well, we we may be entering a new renaissance of artisan work, where people can realize their dreams because suddenly they have means of production in their hands uh, that allows them to make things that were unimaginable to make before. Because they have 3D printers and they have software that makes them easy to produce, you know, a music CD. But my kid in, in the garage for less than a thousand dollars has a has a music studio and uh, in COVID now, you know, he, he's, uh, he just graduated from uh, from high school. They, they did a final rock, you know, kind of uh, piece where they virtually got in all the instruments and he produced it and you know put it into all the various soundtracks and it's really a very tight nice piece and so people were in by I could the see. orchestra <laughs> <laughs> and you know all produced and done in a garage more or less with absolutely no means in terms of expense right yeah. Yeah. and that that is enabling us I think to do many many more things I think that the, you know, when we talked about this old uh, way to organize, Tayloristic, you know, having maybe Charlie Chaplin with Modern Times being the epitaphs, right? That type of work is being taken by the machines. Mm -hmm. why, would, why would you put in humans, you know, into really bad conditions where humans would do all day, you know, a very repetitive kind of task? You know, that already started, of course, with, with robotics and let's say manufacturing, this is going to grow. Um, there are tasks uh, or challenges that go beyond what AI can do, you know, when it comes to uh, you know, creative thinking. I think creativity in, in, in many ways is, is a remaining and growing uh, capability that, that humans will do. So I don't think it's going away, it's going to become more important. And I know I understand you are in, in charge of human resource development and growth and learning and talent. Uh, I think these roles become much, much more important. However, you know, in order to thrive in this role, you also have to redesign the way it is positioned in organizations these days. That's another story. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally a different story. I agree. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, one thing that um, uh, has beaten me over the years is uh, when organizations give you, um, you know, a mandate to develop innovative capability in humans, creativity in human beings. 
and i see that as two ends of the spectrum you know there are people who are creative and there may be people who probably are not aligned to creativity right so the question i have for you is is my thinking wrong um or is there a way where creativity or innovation can be taught to people you know it's basically between the right and the left side of the brain so can we build innovative capability in everyone in an organization everyone is of course a, a steep a steep goal right um i think there are people who are just by nature probably talented mm-hmm. more in terms of creativity um and others maybe not so much what i think you can do is you can create uh, you know a kind of a context a kind of an environment and conditions in which creativity can thrive and you can create conditions in which it cannot thrive so um you know this is really what schools are tasked with by humble opinion uh to really unleash the beast as one company by the way says when it comes to innovation unleash this beast or this kind of energy this kind of spirit of creativity with many fear by the way because mm-hmm. it might go into directions exactly not expected or it's not seen what we want uh but um if if you create these conditions and if you really believe in the uh, human spirit that the test is drive of creating things and if you look at children they naturally do that just that it's cut down by you know so called socializing mm-hmm. the social uh, yeah uh, and and you know there there are efforts like for instance lego you know probably right the the serious play with lego it enhances these creative kind of things uh, way 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 back when i did myself some, some leadership development trainings and things uh we had people draw for instance the uh, current uh you know situation of the company and they made but but it could be whatever they draw the cow was the ceo and you know and that it was milked by the company was milked by the customers and, and all these kind of things it's amazing uh with what kind of things people can come up if you give them an environment in which they can play and do that uh sadly you know we we have the further you go up in the, in the, in the traditional hierarchy these days people unlearn these things very often you know they they are afraid to show that kind of uh you know playfulness uh, you know the, the leader has to be you know with a tie and and a teflon kind uh, you, know, you know always never vulnerable because creativity comes with vulnerability absolutely 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 oh, not not comfortable with your vulnerability then it's it's hard to do that but i think you can you can it's it's almost a therapeutic kind of approach to that you can work with that and i i strongly believe that context is king mm. context is really king if i provide a context that allows this is why people suddenly you know makes workspaces that are like open. famously go way back open you know colorful collaborative things where you go and meet and do these kind of things. And at least today currently Zoom is not allowing us. Mm-hmm. We cannot easily switch. You know, and now let's say and go out and, and, and eat, right? We have how you can say well, I grab my coffee, you grab it's not the same thing. Yeah. So beautiful. So you you believe that context um an ecosystem and the right leadership that nurtures risk taking uh probably are three important things for innovation to survive exist and grow in an organization yes i mean we we mentioned curiosity they all belong together in a way you know creativity if you if you're not curious at all why be creative right i mean it means that the change ability of course i i once did a a little piece on 13 Cs right i mean there is creativity there is curiosity there is collaboration co-creation cross boundary and so on and so forth many of them are Cs and they all need to need to work together um in a way um i think one important that we maybe did not mention yet is one of my Cs back then was caring right caring for the other caring for uh, what is going on in your life 
uh, caring what is your problem, caring what are your challenges. Because if you don't do that, then again, you draw a boundary, right? So I believe that caring, I said this somewhere else, is the, you know, the currency of social networking. It's the currency that creates culture. And we're not talking enough about that because it's so softy kind of thing. I care for somebody. But if you think about knowledge management, you know, without, without, I, I care. This is why I send you an article. I care for you. This is why I share certain things with you. Uh, without that caring, not a lot of stuff happens. So I would add this to the curiosity and to the, you know, connectivity, and especially in an ecosystem context. You know, if, if I don't care what my other stakeholder in the ecosystem does, that wouldn't work at all. Mm -hmm. So in order to shape that ecosystem, so our work at the center, we're currently doing a project where we want to understand better the capabilities it takes to lead in a business ecosystem. But we define lead not in the traditional top-down leadership, but lead as a kind of a responsible influencer who can shape an ecosystem to the benefit of the entire system not maximizing only his or her own profitability or position in the system, but assure, of course, you have to make sure that your identity remains in a way reasonable and, let's say, contributing to the system. If you don't contribute, you know, you can do whatever you want, you probably will lose power. But having said this, if you look at your contribution alone, you won't be able to contribute as much as you look at the functioning and the interplay of the overall system. That, that requires caring, I would say. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, so, you know, a um, lot of C's that we spoke about um, <laughs> and the one that stands out is care, which, which probably care and curiosity, uh, which probably take the slice when it comes to innovation. So beautifully summarized, Roland, beautiful. Um, so, you know, as we are talking, I see a very, um, I see a Roland who is full of smiles. I see a Roland who is reflective. Uh, I see a Roland who is, uh, you know, who is connecting back and forth um, many aspects. I can also see there's a lot of sense making happening behind your responses. Um, what makes Roland, apart from all this, a happy person in the world? <laughs> what makes me a happy person in the world? Having conversations with you like that. Oh. Makes me a happy person. No, you I really- happy I, now, I, Roland. I, you made me happy you now. Have, I tell you something, we have not met before, right? And then you found something out and you reached out. And I just love that, for instance, connecting with the new worlds and new people and new perspectives is something that makes me very happy. I mean, there's so many things that make me happy. It's almost hard to tell. My kids, for instance, make me really happy when I see them grow and develop and uh, develop their own kind of mind. Um, a reading uh, makes me happy, but not business books. I, you know, I, I read really stuff like, I don't know, history, but also good literature. Uh, great music makes me happy. I mean, there's so many things. Food. Good food makes me happy. Uh, but in a nutshell, when I see, you know, community developing and, and being energized and stuff like that, that is also in my professional life, something that really satisfies me a lot. So growing engagement is something that I can see that engagement is growing for a purpose that is a meaningful purpose. That makes me really happy. What makes me really unhappy is, is you know, political apathy. You know, people just, you know, a lot of things make me unhappy too mm. in this situation today in the United States. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, um, it's such a happy Friday for me. One, to have connected with you. Two, my dream coming true of having a conversation with you. And three, for the wide perspectives and insights that I have gained in this very intellectual conversation with you, Roland. All at the same time, making the whole conversation so simple for everyone to understand. And that's 
um, that's your greatness i suppose so uh, thank you so much roland for this wonderful interaction i do hope to stay in touch with you um many congratulations on the wonderful work that you have been executing globally and building wonderful organizational designs for organizations to be most effective uh, moving into the innovation space and leading the path for several people like us so thank you so much roland thanks for your contribution to the world you know i cannot say i thank you very much as well for having me here it's absolutely super pleasurable conversation yeah we definitely will stay in touch absolutely. thank you absolutely have a great and safe friday bye bye thank you bye